so I will give a very brief introduction and then I will turn it over to David, our, uh, our guest host for this, this month. Um, this is the uh, March 2021 Brigade Project Standup. Uh, my name is Will Pfeffer. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a senior program manager on the network team here at Code for America. Um, two quick items to go over before we start. Um, one, as always, uh, the Code for America Code of Conduct um, is, is something that, that we follow at, at all of our events and all, all of our physical and digital spaces. Um, I will post a link to that in the chat if you have not read it before. Uh, please go ahead and, and read it. And then more broadly, uh, just in terms of community norms, um, we try to keep the discussion uh, respectful and, and open-minded and, and try to encourage everyone to, um, to listen more than they speak. Um, someone recently told me a, a quip from a grandmother or something about how you have two ears and one mouth, and so you should be listening twice as much as you speak, which I thought was sort of a charming, um, a charming quip. But uh, anyway, the other thing I will post in the chat is um, a link to a notes doc. I will be taking some notes. I will be posting those notes on Discourse and on um, Slack tomorrow, along with the video from this, which will be posted to YouTube. Um, Anyone who would like to is welcome to jump in and, and assist with that note taking or or, um, or just follow along in the notes. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to David Crawford, um, who is uh, the program manager for our criminal justice work here at Code for America. Great. Thanks so much, Will. Um, I'm really excited to be guest hosting a project stand-up, a criminal justice themed project stand-up. This is really cool. And thanks a lot, Will, for like, you know, providing this theme this month. Um, yeah, my name is David Crawford. I'm a program manager for the criminal justice team at Code for America. Most of my work is on the Clear My Record uh, suite of projects. Uh, pronouns are he, him. Uh, so I will kick us off by going through and reviewing some of the different things that have, we've done on as a part of the criminal justice portfolio. Uh, most of this work is uh, record clearance oriented, but not all of it. Um, and then we'll hear from BTV, Delaware, and Santa Barbara. So let me uh, start sharing my screen. All right, here we go. Okay, so um, you can see here a little mini version of a demo. This is a product called ClientCom, which allowed people on pro, uh, parole officers to communicate with people who are on parole. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's basically a, oh, there we go. It's basically a texting tool, um, just an interface, but for two people to communicate with each other. But the reason it's important is because um, if you are on parole or probation or any kind of correctional supervision that isn't incarceration, there's a whole bunch of hoops you have to jump through. And if you make one little mistake, even if it's not really your fault, um, it can send you right back to prison. So um, ClientCom was one way that we thought there could be a tech intervention that would at least facilitate this process and try to you know, lower the chance of administrative burden. You know, you can see back in the demo thing, it's um, the the uh, the fake person uh, needs to submit a copy of their pay stub um, to meet the requirements of this. So the parole officer is actually prompting them and then they can just upload it uh, when they need it. So it facilitates communication between uh, the probation officer or the parole officer and the person on parole. That, um, was a long time ago. This was back in May 2017. And uh, so some of the, uh, it's not something we actually host anymore. We've handed it off to government partners. Um, I think there is one instance of like one version of it that we still have to host, but no one on our current engineering team knows how to do it, um, which is kind of like an odd little thing. You can see um, here on our slide, the reason we stopped is we did hand it off to the government partners, but then we also switched our focus to record clearance. And um, that's mostly what the Code for America like criminal justice portfolio is known for at this point. So 
That takes us to uh, the original Clear My Record, which we also call classic and sometimes call intake. Um, you can see the little demo on the right. I'll try to go quickly because it's really familiar to a lot of folks. Um, it's essentially an intake form. Uh, you know, not to minimize its importance, but it uh, record clearance is extremely complicated. And uh, the easiest way to do it with a decentralized court system in California, where you still have active people participating in it, was to we fi we figured it would be to connect the person with the record to the actual legal aid who could help them navigate the system. So if you go to clearmyrecord.org, this is still active. You enter some basic information about yourself. And that passes it along to a public defender's office. Um, and you should get a follow up from a public defender within a matter of days. And the public defender will help you fill out the petition and walk you through the whole process. Um, this uh, is <laughs> this was a really short lived project we called Rap Assist. Um, it's uh, basically essentially just using a Google Cloud Vision integration to you hold it up to your rap sheet and it parses it out for you and it uh, tells you what's on it and helps you interpret it. And the idea was that could you could use that to point out the things that were eligible to get expunged. Um, it was a step in the right direction in one sense, but we didn't end up actually going forward with it in the broader sense. Um, we couldn't make it work with actually filing a petition. Um, and for something for, you know, for the documents to the rap sheets to be machine readable, we could get it to work, but the document would have to be like pristine. And when you're talking about rap sheets in California, at least these aren't digital documents. You have to like go get your fingerprint or go get a fingerprint, put it on an application, mail in a fee, mail this all the Department of Justice, and then hope that that document that they mail you back, first of all, they mail it back. And second of all, that it's like in good condition. So it was a good idea. We just couldn't really make it work in practice. Um, but that's okay because we took another direction where we figured why have all these like human intervention processes for the person with the record themselves and we can just clear the records automatically. So uh, over the course of 2018 and 2019, Code for America launched five county pilot programs. Uh, the first one you can see with District Attorney George Gascon, who's now the DA of LA, but back then he was the DA of San Francisco. And this was to help in implement the 2016 law um, Prop 64, which legalized cannabis use for adults recreationally in California. Um, uh, at that point, people had to use the petition process to get their cannabis convictions cleared, even though they were no longer crimes. Between then and now, only 3% of people with eligible cannabis records were actually able to get them cleared one way or another using the petition process. So this was a step one where you worked with Gascon, who was really interested in taking proactive steps to clear these records. And then building on that, it expanded to four other counties across the state. Um, and that led to a statewide law called um, Assembly Bill 1793, which told all DAs that they had to do this. Um, you couldn't just rely on the petition process or the goodwill of your DA you have to take active steps to actually do this and implement this. So Code for America responded by creating a thing we called internally BEAR, Bulk Assess Expungement Analysis of Records, which is one of those backronyms. Um, but essentially what this did, was, it's just a very basic script that uh, helped the district attorneys parse a ton of data. The Department of Justice came up with a giant list of every uh, possible cannabis expungement that they had on record and sent it out to the DAs and said, okay, have at it. And they didn't have any like context or capability to what to do with this. So this was like a free open source software that you can kind of plug and play and it'll help you parse through the different um, records that you're getting from the uh, Department of Justice so that you can spit out the ones that are eligible uh, to be expunged. And you take that data, the district attorneys deliver it to the courts and then the courts are supposed to clear it themselves which we can talk about that offline, uh, the extent to which that's actually happened at this point. Um, another, uh, another kind of fork that we're exploring is a thing, uh, we just internally call this the CGLA tool. It's, we're partnering with a group in uh, Cook County, Illinois, that's where Chicago is, called the Greeny Green Legal Aid Clinic. Um, and this is a petition tool. It, uh, 
accesses uh, through Tyler Technologies is the case management software that the uh, Cook County uses. It's similar to Oregon, and this, this tool is actually very similar to um, Record Sponge from the Portland Brigade that they created as well. Um, but yeah, it uses Tyler API plugins to access all the court data and then streamline it for the legal aid so that um, with a minimal amount of information, they can populate uh, petitions really easily. Um, and then the, so we are working on those things, uh, except for the closed pilot projects, but we also have some other stuff that's in the work that isn't necessarily like a project that you can demo. Uh, we're helping to implement automatic record clearance in Utah. Oh, I think, well, now you know it's Utah. I didn't, I specifically didn't put the state on here, but I guess the cat's out of the bag. But uh, Utah passed a law called the Clean Slate Act a few years ago, and it automatically clears a number of, a range of misdemeanors based on how many certain people have and how long it's been. Uh, and they passed that law without a huge plan in terms of how to implement it. So we've been working with the courts there to come up with an entity resolution software that takes all the cases over here and all the individuals over here and matches them together and says, these are the ones that need to be cleared. Um, and we're also working on this new project that um, is just fresh out of the discovery phase called Delivering Impact. And it's trying to bridge the gap between record clearance itself and like actually being able to use that in what you do with your life after that. Um, it's one thing to just change a court uh, case disposition in the database. It's another thing to have somebody truly comprehend, I can get this type of license. I can apply for this job and this won't show up on my background check, but this one will. I employer or landlords aren't allowed to ask, ask about this if it's been cleared in this and this, and this will show up between seven years, this will show up in five. It's really complicated even if you have an automated system in the clear record. So we're exploring different ways that we can use tech interventions, products, um, and community partnerships to try to bridge those two gaps. Uh, so if you have your record clear, it really does um, give you a whole new opportunity in life. So those are what Code for America's criminal justice portfolio projects are. Um, if there's questions at the end, we can come back to them, but I think uh, more exciting news would be to hear from Code for BTV. Yeah, thank you for that. And I definitely uh, do have questions, but <laughs> I will try and remember them. But um, uh, um, yeah, very cool stuff. Uh, a lot of which I didn't know about. So, um, so if you give me a moment, I'll share my screen. Um, I'm Jake Durrell from Code for BTV. I'm, I'm here with Micah, um, who'll be speaking in a moment as well. Um, and also, Nick, one of our brigade captains, is here as well. Um, sharing my screen. What are folks seeing? We, or am I not sharing? See, <laughs> I think we see what we need to see. We see a um, a court a, a petition. A petition. All right. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm normally on team. So, I mean, I'm on zoom, you know, maybe once or twice a week, but I always forget everything about it. Um, all right. So I'm just going to talk briefly about where we kind of came in. Um, so there was already a lot of foundation laid. Um, we, we, we have been developing an extensive uh, body of expungement law, um, for, you know, probably over a decade now, but like really heating up over the last few years, uh, largely due in part to the work of legal aid. Um, so, you know, we we, we have, uh, um, this is just our expungement session, but like just a lot of, these are actually excluded crimes that, but, you know, basically um, any misdemeanor offense that is not, um, you know, one of these listed crimes, which opens up a lot of things, um, and then, you know, now we're talking about opening up a lot of felonies every year, like here's some current legislation that um, we're, we're opening up more, you know, probably this will get passed and opening up more and more every year. So Legal Aid's been working on that front. And then they started a few years ago organizing these clinics, um, you know, a Maraid from Legal Aid, she uh, um, started doing this work, I think, in, in the context of um, 
uh, like opioid, uh, you know, working in healthcare law um, and um, in the opioid crisis and finding that this was a need and she was constantly filing these and seeing that it was something that could be um, like a lot of it was, uh, uh, you know, fair, fa fairly uh, um, administrative and, um, you know, didn't need the legal expertise. And she started organizing these clinics. So we came into these clinics and um, this is just a small uh, uh, sample of them, but, you know, they have all these forms laid out on a table and they're meeting with clients going through their record and then um, filling them out. And, but they might figure out um, something and, or learn something partway through the two or three hours that they're sitting with them and then go and they need another form and they need to manually fill that out. And they're jumping between them and there's a lot of different options to decide from, um, you know, like um, uh, we just heard in the last presentation um, that that there's really a whole web of decisions that need to be made. You know, there are some things that are um, susceptible to automated expungement and by January 1st, 2022, like in Vermont, all marijuana offenses will be um, that the courts have to find a way to expunge those, but there, there's always gonna be offenses where you need to go to a judge um, and you need some legal assistance and um, to help make that argument for you about why your offense should be expunged. So um, this was going on and we were trying to find a way to work with legal aid and we saw this and, and this is uh, where we thought we could um, create something that would uh, be of uh, uh, assistance. Um, so I'm gonna turn the screen over to Micah. I'll keep talking for a second. Well, he um, brings up the tool uh, has in its current state. Um, but basically because we, um, so like in the last presentation we heard, there's this kind of balance of, you know, it's good that we make the records difficult to access uh, because then they can't, it's more difficult to aggregate them because once they get into a, you know, commercial sector, then, then they'll exist there forever and people will be able to find them in background checks. So Vermont does a good job of protecting that, but then only certain people can access the records. Um, and um, in Vermont, it's limited to criminal justice organizations that can access the records online. And anybody can go into a court and do a records request for an individual case, but to be able to search and access them online, you need to be affiliated with a um, criminal justice organization like, like Legal Aid. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, so we needed something that attorneys could use that could um, use that, uh, 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 use these sites and pull data off of them and turn them into petitions. Um, so we were originally working with the, are you sharing yet, Micah, or do I need to unshare? Oh, no, uh, <laughs> you've got the screen there. Um, you can either uh, run it on your well, yeah, I'll bring up. I'll, I'll bring it up to start. Okay. And then, uh, okay. So this is this is on the older system. This was actually just phased out last month. We we and now we have a Tyler Tech system. But this system definitely did not like have an API for us to tap into, and so we needed to make something to um, pull data off of this. Um, and so. Um, we were able to, to work that out. So we made an extension and the idea is not to, because so an attorney has to use this because they're the only one that can see the record, but they're also needed in the process. And the idea is not to eliminate the need for the attorney. Um, it's to um, you know, just make their process more efficient so they can focus on what they do best and, and, and um, spend less time with administrative work and more time focusing on the core of the petition. So um, this, this is our uh, uh, we, a Chrome extension pop-up and you know, we felt that was the best avenue for this. And um, what, what uh, w this just provides like a little blurb. We just had a clinic last Friday, so people can click on it, open it up and see when the next clinic is coming. Um, so if I click add from page, then it just immediately pulls this offense on there and um, 
and provide some prompts for the attorney so they can quickly decide, well, what kind of petition um, am, I, am I dealing with? Um, so um, a misdemeanor that was dismissed, so it's a, a expunged not in conviction. And you know, the other thing I should mention about these clinics, we didn't only have the coordination of legal aid and attorneys that were volunteering with legal aid. Uh, we have the prosecutors that regularly attend these clinics um, and even now in, in the remote setting attend them and are there to sign off on them because the petition is much more likely to get granted if it if it's signed off on. So most of the time we're doing stipulated petitions. So this would be a stipulated expunge non-conviction because it was dismissed, um, which is just as, as important for somebody's record even though it was dismissed to not have it pop up and be a question for them for whoever is interested in their background. Um, so once you select that, you I could keep adding counts. I could go to different courts and add counts, like different counties and pull them in. If they're older, so old that they're not online, but they still exist out there, I can manually add them by going to this add edit page. We can see the one that we just pulled in um, that full breakdown of it and I can edit that, but I could also click up here and add another count. Um, and then um, I'm going to click on petitions and we can actually see the um, generated uh, petition. Um, you get a cover letter um, and, and you can uh, essentially a, a you know, based on what, there's different capacity somebody might be preparing this petition. Uh, you might be a legal aid attorney, like full-on attorney, you're gonna enter an appearance. You might be legal aid attorney, you're gonna help them fill it out, but they'll be going pro se, uh, you know, if there's not a concern for, for them, you know, if you know it's gonna be approved without a hearing. Um, and then uh, sometimes uh, this, the state will um, prepare peti petitions, uh, um, because they're they're agreeing to it and um, and so they would be a form letter in there um, saying um, you know clarifying the capacity that they're filling the petition in. Um, so these are settings that do save to the um, you know local storage, but the rest of it, all this data is just in in um, uh, temporary the session storage and clears when you um, close the browser. Uh, so that was kind of the uh, understanding that we're not going to save and aggregate this data when we made an arrangement with the judiciary. Um, so yeah, and then now you can see the petition here um, is generated and has the necessary information filled in. Um, and going to print it. Uh, and in the end, I think prints what's a uh, nice looking Oh, I forgot to mention the checkout sheet. This, a lot of times we'll have, a, somebody will have 10, 12 or more offenses. It could be a really rough time period of their life and they don't even know. So even if you can't help them with everyone that day, giving them, like helping them kind of take that inventory and see what they've got and are dealing with can be like a service in its own. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, we get the notice of appearance entered. Um, the, uh, but yeah, the stipulated petition um, and in a stylish looking uh, uh, pleading. Um, and yeah, and if I wanna switch the petition and say, oh, they're not gonna stipulate, okay, we'll just do expunge on conviction. And then it ch changes it and puts the information in there. And so this allows the attorney to focus on this piece um, of expunging all uh, the interests of justice statement which uh and so they can work with the client why why do you need this why, why, why is uh you know this offense no longer relevant to who you are now and um and they don't need to spend time with this administration so i'll hand it over to you Micah, to fill in where oh I you think, haven't taken uh, all your time i think that's uh i mean you've covered pretty much everything the um <laughs> the important uh takeaway uh, for me was that, you know, at the beginning, you can see how complicated uh, it was for volunteer attorneys uh, trying to help people fill out these forms uh, manually. Every one of the uh, forms that Jake looked through there uh, was something that you needed to um, 
copy information off the internet of, uh, with a pen. <laughs> it's slow, it's tedious and uh, error prone. <clears throat> and uh, being able to hit that parse button and immediately print, uh, generate a printable pre-populated form has been a huge time saver. Um, also add that in the last uh, uh, two years, uh, Vermont's seen the number of individual petitions that uh, have been asked to um, be removed go from about 2,500 to uh, a little over 14,000. And uh, we were told by, by Vermont Legal Aid that this, uh, this tool uh, played a big role in that, in that it was uh, really facilitated their, uh, their clinics which is a major driver for them to discover who in fact even needs to have records expunged. Um, that may have be, be the uh, biggest benefit uh, to this tool <clears throat> is making those clinics happen, which are uh, great um, sort of intake opportunities for Vermont Legal Aid. But yeah, I think that's a good summary. Yeah, and we, we just spent a lot of time converting it over to work with the Tyler Technologies, um, you know, the new system that was in there. And so when you said that, uh, and we, we have brought up the idea of the API um, with the judiciary, and it just seemed like a no way, never type of thing. But um, so I'm just, I'm interested to hear more about that. Uh, um, because yeah, maybe, maybe they're just not aware that it's an easy thing for Tyler to accomplish if it is. Uh, I think that's about it for us. Awesome. That's yep. so amazing. Wait, uh, just to wrap up real fast, because I know we uh, have to move on, but I remember hearing some news a couple months ago about uh, some numbers. Uh, did we touch on that? Some big numbers? Yeah, I, I did briefly um, <clears throat> when I mentioned that the uh, Vermont uh, CSE uh, the office responsible for uh, actually expunging and removing the records. Um, the I have a beautiful little graph that I won't bother to show you right now, but um, in the last three years, <clears throat> they've seen um, the numbers go from about 2,500 to 14,000. Um, and uh, that's the uh, probably the biggest, most tangible um, uh, metric we've seen with uh, this tool. And uh, as soon as I saw them, I went back and <clears throat> asked around a little bit. And um, indeed, there are a number of different components in you know, the judiciary system here that have enabled that to happen. Um, but this tool expediting the uh, um, generation of petitions for Vermont Legal Aid's uh, clinic attorneys uh, was part of that. Yeah, some, somebody's asking if um, the, there's an increase in the number of attorneys. And um, I, I think there has been. I mean, there's been more and more of these clinics open. And we actually, we have the attorney general's office participate in uh, these clinics like at least once a quarter. And and they, they kind of, it's funny, they participate in two capacities. They, um, uh, they, you know, there's some attorneys there signing off on the petitions on behalf of the state, but the others, as long as there's not a conflict, they can actually represent, um, you know, the petitioners um, seeking to expunge their records. So we do these trainings um, and we run through the tool and we run through the law, we run through the tool and, and we can very efficiently get, get them onboarded because the tool is, tool is there. So there's greater per participation, but it's po made possible with the tool. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, up next, we have uh, Delaware. Great, uh, thank you, David. Um, my name is uh, Eli Turkel. Uh, I'm an organizer with Open Data Delaware. Uh, I'll be presenting with Abby Samuels and Eric Truitt tonight. Uh, we'll be talking about Delaware's, uh, Open Data Delaware's um, court bot iteration. And so this is very much um, a work in progress. So we're kind of 
you should, this presentation should be, should be taken as kind of a, uh, like a status report um, as, as from where we stand uh, with um, getting uh, CourtBot off the ground in the state of Delaware. Uh, I'm going to give kind of like an overview of like the genesis of the project and how, you know, we, it kind of came to be and who our partners are. Um, and then Abby will kind of talk about the project itself and some of the legal issues that are particular to Delaware. And then Eric will talk about um, the technology that, that we're, we're using and the technological challenges um, that, that we're working through. So um, I'm going to share my screen. And so I first wanted to just give a shout out to Tulsa um, and their CourtBot iteration. This like, project for me really started, um, I think it was the 2000, Mike can correct me, but I think it was the 2018 uh, uh, Code for America or uh, Brigade Congress uh, where uh, BTV and, um, uh, and Tulsa and Alaska talked about their CourtBot iterations. And I just kind of, thought that this was a project that I really wanted to, to pursue and just, um, you know, kind of kept talking about it with people in Open Data Delaware and, uh, you know, talking to, to Carlos Moreno and, and Diana from, from Code for Tulsa and uh, just kind of tried to get an understanding of what, what CorpBot was. And, and um, uh, I just think that they did such a great job with the project that I wanted to try to replicate it um, here in, in Delaware. Um, and at the time I was like doing my PhD in public policy at UD and I, uh, you know, was kind of, I was running the, the, the hack nights, uh, for open data Delaware and it, we just couldn't find a foothold. Um, and, um, oddly enough, the pandemic actually is kind of what allowed this project to take, take off. Um, and so, um, what ended up happening was uh, we had to stop do doing our uh, in-person hack nights and it kind of freed me up to uh, think about kind of bigger projects. Um, and uh, Abby is a, a dear friend, a longtime family friend. And um, when we were no longer doing hack nights, um, at least they're no longer really having show people show up to our virtual hack nights, I reached out to her um, and asked her if, you know, kind of explained what CorpBot was and asked her if this was something that, that Classy, uh, Abby is a staff attorney at uh, Delaware Community Legal Aid, if this was something that Classy would be, would be interested in. And she said yes, she was excited about the project and thought that maybe the, the pandemic and um, the kind of, this kind of, um, this coming wave of, of evictions that, that uh, is expected uh, once the eviction moratorium is raised would be uh, um, a good way to, to kind of, um, you know, ha narrow the focus of the project and just think about building a court bot iteration uh, in Delaware that was focused on evictions. And so that's the Delaware court bot uh, iteration is, is focused on evictions and uh, providing uh, a reminder system uh, for people um, who um, have an eviction hearing um, to get a text message alert reminder about that about that hearing. So Delaware Open Data Delaware and Classy formed that partnership, and we've been working together since I think July, uh, meeting regularly. Um, and then the, the another another organization that we've um, formed a partnership with um, is Network Delaware, um, and actually I just realized that uh, that it's actually all, not just Network Delaware, but also the um, Wilmington Urban League. Uh, Wilmington is a small city in, in Delaware, though it's our largest city. Um, and uh, they have a, a team um, called the Homes Campaign that's doing direct outreach to constituents and, and um, uh, talking about tenant rights and, and what the law in Delaware is around, around evictions. Um, and we're starting to partner with them and, and finding ways to collaborate with them um, over the grassroots canvassing that they're doing. And we're hoping to build um, kind of a reciprocal relationship with them where we can hopefully provide data uh, from public data that's available on a website called Court Connect that Eric will talk about later. Um, and, um, you know, and, and having uh, coming up with a data sharing agreement with them where, you know, folks that are, are interested in signing up for CorpBot that they're talking to at the doors uh, would be able to, they would be able to share that information with us. 
Um, and then the, the fourth partner in this project um, is the Delaware court system. So we um, met with uh, the courts, we've met with the courts once so far. Uh, we met with the courts, I think back in October, maybe early November, but, um, and they were very uh, receptive to the project. Um, the pandemic has certainly slowed um, court proceedings in the state of Delaware, um, like it has, uh, I would imagine, in all places. And uh, the Delaware court system is trying to respond to that um, by moving uh, more um, trials to kind of um, online alternative dispute resolution system that they're building, which would be kind of, which would be obviously a virtual space. Um, and they kind of, and the, the online dispute resolution system that they're standing up um, doesn't necessarily have like a way to remind people about those hearings, um, even though they are online, they're still, they still take place at a certain time. And uh, I don't think that they're the vendor that they partnered with uh, provided um, that tool. So they're kind of, I think their main interest in court bot is, um, you know, that it would be an add on to to that system and, and allow that that uh, alternative dispute resolution system to function well. Uh, and so we're hopeful that uh, we have a meeting with the Delaware courts next week uh, on the 16th, and we're hopeful that um, they kind of decide to partner with us in, you know, entering um, into a data sharing uh, agreement with us. The, uh, the data that would be used for this project is fully public, but um, there are some disclaimers on the website that tell you not to use it. So we do want to have, we would like to have an affirmative from the Delaware courts that they're okay with us using this data for this purpose. Um, and we think that, you know, those kind of four partners working together um, could really start to build momentum and um, not, you know, and have Corpot, we're hoping to launch this iteration of Corpot on July 1. Um, and, you know, we want to really work with all these partners to make sure that it's successful and that people um, uh, use our iteration of Corpot. So now I will turn it over to Abby. Yeah, thanks, Eli. Um, hi, everyone. Like Eli said, my name is Abby Samuels. I am a legal aid lawyer in Delaware. Um, and I'm really excited about this project. I think like most legal aid lawyers, I can, you know, envision ways that um, creative sort of technology projects can enhance the work that I do and that our my organization does. Um, but often we, I think as organizations lack the expertise to be able to kind of accomplish those things ourselves. And so these types of collaborative projects are really exciting for us. Um, just a little bit of background about why we felt like this might be a good fit for the eviction context in Delaware, um, as opposed to um, the sort of criminal court context, which I think is um, the setting that this tool is used in Tulsa and in some of the other places where they've created similar projects. Um, selfishly, I, you know, I'm a civil legal aid lawyer. And so when Eli mentioned this, you know, the work that I'm most closely doing with that I thought this could fit into was the eviction context. But like Eli said, this, um, there's this website in Delaware that makes um, dockets for every eviction case that gets filed in the housing court public. And so I knew that that information was readily available. And, um, you know, I thought it would be an interesting way to kind of you know, take back some of the power of that information, I think being publicly available often causes harm to people because you can look back, you know, years and years and see if and how many times someone has been evicted. And so I thought this would be an interesting way to try to use that information um, to do, you know, something that would be helpful for people. Um, a professor at the University of Delaware recently did a study about evictions, um, which I think uh, got us some helpful data to sort of, you know, you know, make the case that this was sort of the right time to be doing this project. So they looked at a set of eviction cases from a few years ago. And what they found was that 72% of possession judgments are entered by default. So I'll explain what that means. A possession judgment in an eviction case is essentially an eviction judgment. This is a court order that tells a landlord that they have the right to take possession of a rental property back from the tenant by evicting them. So a possession judgment is what a landlord gets when they win, when they get to evict their tenant. 
Um, and so the study showed that almost three quarter of those three quarters of those judgments were being entered by default and a default judgment is um, the type of judgment that gets entered in a case when the tenant fails to appear. So when the tenant doesn't show up, the landlord can win and get something called a default judgment. Um, and what that means is that the tenant isn't there to sort of defend their case to give the court their side of the story. And so the judge is making a decision based only on the information and evidence being presented by the landlord. There's no one disputing anything the landlord says or providing any additional information that could impact the outcome of the case. So that means that a lot of the cases in which landlords are winning, um, they're doing that, you know, in the absence of the tenant, really, you know, just getting to go in, those hearings go really quickly. The standard, you know, is technically the same legally, you know, in order for the for the landlord to win, but they really the bar is kind of low in terms of what they have to to present to get their their judgment. Um, you know, another sort of important factor in this is a, a movement towards the right to counsel for tenants who are facing eviction. This is happening um, in Delaware and a lot of jurisdictions around the country. They're pushing to enact legislation that would essentially create the right for um, low-income tenants who are facing eviction to be represented by a lawyer. So this is passed in New York City and a couple of other places in Delaware is really sort of uh, the movement to, to create this legislation and enact it is growing. And, um, you know, having an attorney in these cases is sort of one facet of this larger um, goal to really engage tenants in this process. Because we see landlords a lot of the time are winning because tenants aren't just aren't even showing up. Um, and so what's really important and what can lead to better outcomes is having a tenant engage in the process. Eli mentioned cases can get settled out of court. Um, you know, people can reach agreements and agree to, um, you know, have the case dismissed and resolve it informally. You know, sometimes tenants defend their case and they win. And so, you know, by, by virtue of participating, the chances of, um, you know, attendance getting better outcomes in these cases significantly increases. Um, so if you could move to the next slide, Eli. So our goal is to sort of, um, you know, create a tool that contributes to all of this momentum and um, this movement to really engage tenants in this process. We don't know, you know, we don't have data or hard numbers about why tenants don't show up to court, but we can make sort of educated guesses based on anecdotal things we hear from our clients and from people in the community. Um, and, you know, people who are facing an eviction may be experiencing, you know, trauma and chaos in their lives and may not be staying on top of things like court notices that they get in the mail. Um, and so the idea is to just create a simple tool that will send tenants text message reminders about their upcoming hearings and their eviction case to sort of serve as a reminder to, um, you know, keep this on a tenant's radar and to try to engage them in the process. You can go to the next slide. So the way that we envision this tool working is that a tenant um, can enroll to receive text message reminders by sending a text to a designated number with their case number. Um, we also want to have a sort of landing page, um, like a website that people can go to that will sort of guide them through the instructions about how to enroll, um, sort of send them to where they can go to look up their case number if they don't have that. Um, and like Eli mentioned, we really um, appreciate the, um, the project that Tulsa um, created and their website, I think, um, you know, is sort of what we're, we're going for in terms of it being very simple and user friendly and having just really um, clear information that hopefully almost any person could read and, and understand. Um, and then once enrolled in the program, the idea is that tenants would receive text message reminders leading up to their hearing date to remind them about the time, um, the date and the location of the hearing. Uh, another thing that happens, a lot of our clients rely on uh, public transportation and sometimes arrive late to hearings and even being five, 10 minutes late can mean that your landlord gets a default judgment against you if you weren't there on time. Right now, everything is being conducted by Zoom, but eventually, um, you know, we'll probably be back at the courthouse. Um, and so, you know, just having a reminder that people can uh, get a couple of, of days out and the day before a hearing that reminds them of, you know, the time, especially, I think um, will be hopefully really helpful for people. 
Um, and as Eli mentioned, this uh, information is all publicly available. So our hope is to sort of get the court's blessing so that we can scrape this from um, the publicly available court dockets that are published online. Next slide. Um, so this is just sort of a, a draft of, of the message that um, you know, we envision sending to people who enroll in this program. We've sort of played around with whether we can personalize messages more and maybe include a person's first name. Um, we're also um, talking about different ways that we might be able to facilitate text messages being sent in languages other than English for um, individuals who's, who don't speak English or who prefer correspondence in another language. So those are just a couple of the logistics that we're thinking up. Um, when it looks like it's it's time for us to wrap up. So we can go through the next slides. So Eric can just talk briefly about sort of the technology component. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Okay, so basically um, Delaware's docket system is just like uh, BTV is probably aware of from their past experience. Um, it's an older, software this thing is uh circa like 2001 so every, like on this page here you can see a snapshot of a sample and it's all old school html and it's presented in frames and it's presents a problem as far as we're aware uh there's no api or any kind of advanced method of like a web service to request raw data in its just data format so we have to scrape this um one of the projects, uh, like if you look at like Tulsa code for Tulsa, they actually have access to an API. Whereas with us, we have to actually load each individual record and then scrape it using, uh, right now we're looking at using beautiful soup in Python, which really boils it down pretty easily. Um, if anybody is interested in looking at that, the actual code or discussing the, the actual implications of how to do that, uh, you can reach out to me on Slack. Um, I believe we actually have to move on to code for Santa Barbara for time. Great. Well, thank you guys for uh, uh, listening. And uh, yeah, if there are questions, we'll, we'll take those um, after Santa Barbara presents. Hello, can everyone see me? Yep, we can. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So great to have you here. We would first like to thank those that made this presentation possible and those in attendance who came to support. Uh, we are Team Santa Barbara at Code for America, currently developing a reentry application for people returning to Santa Barbara after incarceration. Uh, we are partnering with the Santa Barbara Public Defender's Office. Before introducing our team, I'd like to pass it to Jean Marie so she could outline the agenda for the day. Everyone. So we want to chat through some um, three major goals, why we're here and who we are, number two, what we have learned, and number three, where we want to go and how we plan to get there. So we were presented with this problem statement at the beginning of our fellowship. Um, it says, how might the County of Santa Barbara Public Defender make supported programs and resources accessible to, ju to justice impacted residents to improve the quality of their lives and reduce recidivism? And before we jump into the content, we want to introduce ourselves. What makes us unique as a team is our why. So my name is Jean Marie. I use pronouns she, her, hers. I serve as the product designer for this project. The problem is personal to me because I've had family members who have been impacted by the justice system. I am also a current Santa Barbara resident, and I deeply care about this town and advocating for the needs of this community, especially in a place like Santa Barbara, where they often go unheard. I'll pass it off to Tim. Hello. My name is Timothy Malstead. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a software engineer with the Santa Barbara Reentry Project. This is an important project to me because similar to Jean Marie, I have friends and family who have been repeatedly victimized by the carceral state. And with this project, I'm happy to contribute to changing that. With that, I will pass it to my colleague, Victor. Yeah, my name is Victor Salcida. I use he, him pronouns. I'm also a software engineer who brings a unique skill set to this project. I have lived experience. After spending over a decade in prison 
and currently going through the reentry process myself. My perspectives and insights bring great benefit to the development of this application. This project is very purposeful to me because it allows me the opportunity to give back to my community and to better understand what it might take to succeed. To, succeed. to better understand how we are going to solve this problem is to, it's important to understand what's currently happening in Santa Barbara County. So right now, if you are going through the reentry process, you are met with a bulletin board of resources. Um, this, these were photos that Victor was able to take when he visited the probation office. As you can see, there's multiple forms to sort through. Lots of information can be incredibly overwhelming and addresses are even updated with pencil. So for someone who's trying to seek support, this can be incredibly frustrating. You can spend three hours on the phone and still not get to where you want to be. This is a direct quote from Lisa, a formerly incarcerated person whom we interviewed in the course of our research. So our goal is to take these resources that are listed at some of these CBOs and leverage technology so that we create a platform for all Santa Barbara residents to have access to these resources in a centralized location. But it's a lot more than just building a product, as we know. Um, we found that yes, these resources are needed, but in Santa Barbara County, there's a greater problem. Um, it's really based on who you know in the county and that will give you the success of your reentry process. So it's crucial to increase the accessibility and accuracy of these resources. We have also learned that Santa Barbara itself, if you all aren't familiar, it's kind of known as a paradise, a tourist location where nothing bad happens. This can give a lot of shame and guilt for those who are reentering because they just have a lot of shame and guilt about their past. For example, Chris here shares, once you feel involved in the community, you fall in love with the community. There's no way I turn my back on this place again. Chris was a formerly incarcerated person and we asked them how to reduce recidivism. Chris was able to get involved in their community college. He was able to find a sense of empowerment and overall advocated for his needs. So how can we accomplish this as an app? Well, that's where our project comes in. We overall wanna bring an increased awareness to the needs of the justice impacted community. So what have we done so far since October when we all came together? We've done a lot. Um, lots of research has been done, which we're trying to illustrate to you all here. And we've built a partnership with um, a UCSB student organization called Underground Scholars. And they've been um, with us throughout the whole building of the app. Um, we've done lots of data entry, making sure that again, those uh, all the CBOs and service providers have accurate and up-to-date information. And Victor can explain some other wins as well. Yeah, what was really satisfying about our qualitative research is the ability to understand the person that will be using this application. We were able to interview individuals who are currently going through the reentry process and understand exactly what those needs are. It is difficult to get a yes, but it's easy, just as easily difficult to get a true no. I'm sorry. This is led by Frida, who is a current person that works at a community-based organization, and they were expressing frustration with um, the current other competitor that is out there that you just really don't know where your client stands when you're trying to advocate for them and their needs. And these were a list of the client pain points. Uh, we noticed that people were feeling helpless, isolated, and not knowing where to go a fear of being judged, a want for a supportive community environment, but not knowing where to seek that, unaware of the wealth of resources. There was a lack of housing, transportation, food, and other wraparound resources to get them back on their feet. And the barriers that limit access to resources can include incorrect information, lack of trust, and confusing long processes. So with these pain points in mind, we really also wanted to highlight that we use human-centered design um, where we're constantly, what it sounds like, putting the humans that are using the product at the center of every decision we make. We seek feedback from community-based organizations, the clients themselves, and it's a circle. So constantly as we're building, learning, and measuring, we continuously come back to those humans that are using it. And with that research, we were able to build a journey map. 
So this was really crucial for us because the reentry process is incredibly complicated and can vary based on the individual. So when mapping this out, we were able to clearly see the major touch points as well as the feelings, the pain points, and overall opportunities where our app and resource could best um, make an impact. What we really found was that in order to improve the lives of these individuals, it's vital to recognize their life experiences. Um, for example, if you are a veteran and you are trying to find a shelter, but you also have a pet, how can you navigate that with a bulletin board? Um, user flows and deep, really fine-tuned uh, filter processes are something that we're looking into doing. Um, but more importantly, we just really wanted to give the ownership back to those who have lost the autonomy over their lives. We had our first phase of building that Tim will share. Thank you, Jean Marie. This is our first trip around the human centered design cycle and we've got more to go, but we're pretty proud of what we have so far. So far, we've stayed focused on simplicity, accessibility and usability. Clean layout, easy to read and understand that lets the content be front and center. You can click on a category and you will be taken to a list of organizations able to help. The list is searchable. Uh, and there is also a map interface so you can see exactly where an organization is located. Once you have selected an organization, you are taken to a screen containing information about the organization's locations, services offered, and when they are available. You also have the option to text this to a mobile phone. This is my number, nobody spam me. <laughs> can't see it, but that did come through on my phone. Uh, if you do not wish to search by category, all of the information we have is indexed and searchable by the top level. You can access it through individual organization and location or with the more uh, centralized uh, map interface. Mm. Lastly, we are fine tuning our support for English and Spanish language localization. Actually, that's better illustrated here. In addition to being able to manually switch between the two, Fresh Start is smart enough that if you change your uh, language settings, change it back to English, start. Uh, it will use a variant, it sees that you are using a variant of Spanish and will adjust itself accordingly. In addition to these features, we are aiming to make this uh, downloadable on mobile and desktop devices. Future plans include live updating data, informational pages, improved search, and a more intuitive and modern UI. So where do we go from here? We continue to build community support, test this product with humans that will be using it, seek guidance from subject matter experts, deploy an MVP of this product, and iterate as needed. Something we also started was a brigade. Um, so now Code for Santa Barbara exists, and we're really excited and inspired by the interest and in new collaborations to come. like to thank all of you for coming. We're excited about the possibilities of our project and we'd love to hear your feedback. Wow, that's great. And let's hear it for Code for Santa Barbara. How cool is that? All right, um, so we are going into question and answer right now. Um, I feel like I might actually turn over the guest hosting duties back to Will for this. Thanks, David. Um, and yeah, this is this is really inspiring work from from all three of these presenters. It's it's very very cool to see like really tangible examples of of brigades and fellows doing like work that has direct benefit in people's lives in their community. So so really, congratulations on on the great work you're all doing. Um, it's also cool to see sort of three different um, examples of, of different sort of points of entry into, into how civic tech can, can help out in the criminal justice space. So, so I, I um, 
and enjoyed seeing that as well. Um, so from here on, we are uh, we are scheduled for another 25 minutes until until half past uh, eight if you're on the East Coast or five if you're on the West Coast. Um, the two things that I would like to go into from here, uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q and A, and I'm sure that that folks will have other questions. I would also like to invite anybody on the call who is also working on a criminal justice themed project. I, I know I, I recognize a handful of names from the uh, from the Flintsight channel and, and Justice at CFA channel on, on our Slack. Um, if folks want to jump in and give us a, a you know brief uh, one, two, maybe three minute update on what you're working on and, and what the status of that is, um, that would be great to see too. Um, so to facilitate all that, I think there are enough of us that I am not going to promote everybody to a panelist. I, that'll that'll take a minute, but if you want to raise your hand, I can um, make it so that you can uh, you can ask your question. Just a quick note on that: um, we are recording this and we'll be posting it to our uh, the Code for America YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, so if you don't want your uh, want your face on that recording, you're welcome to keep your camera off. Or, or if you don't want your voice on it, um, please do feel free to use the chat function or the Q and A function, and I can ask those questions for you. Um, but to get us started, there were a couple of questions that came in um, from Anne at the beginning, which I, I think David are primarily for you, although I think that they. Um, apply to other folks. So Anne first asks um, if client comm could be used as a texting not notice for court. So if, if client comm has an application in the, the court bot space. You know, I wish I could tell you. I don't know enough about it. Um, it's kind of like a product that we've uh, obsoleted at this point, but I think I could pass that actually over to Delaware. Maybe there, or maybe Anne has a follow-up or Delaware has something to add about the use of uh, court bot for this. Um, so I guess, yeah, so I think that this could probably be answered by several different people, but I, I guess what I would say is that, um, uh, you know, the court, um, the rules of the court uh, vary widely by jurisdiction, uh, which is kind of what makes um, it difficult to, uh, just like fork the previous iterations of CourtBot. Um, that, that was one of the lessons uh, that I learned actually from the uh, 2018 uh, uh, Brigade Congress session on CourtBot. So, you know, the system in Vermont works very differently than the system in Tulsa, works very differently than the system in Delaware. Um, so it's difficult to just kind of plug and play the technology in, in, that, in that way is what I would say. Um, but I do think that it's helpful to, if like for CorePot specifically, it's very, very helpful to look at the various iterations that um, are cur currently underway. Um, you know, this because they provide a really great um, way to get into what CorePot is and how how folks have rolled it out other places. And I think doing that, and you know, I'm happy to talk with people. I'm sure others are happy to talk with with you. Uh, and if you're interested in in, in starting a CorePot iteration. Thanks, Eli. There, there's another question here, um, also from Anne, which I think is is relevant to everyone, and, and I know, um, or is relevant to, to all of our panelists, I know. I'm not sure if anyone from the Code for Boston Clean Slate team is, is still on the, the call. I, I think I saw some names I recognized earlier, um, but I know that that is something that they have some insight into. Um, so Anne asks, I work in Georgia at a law office, not as a coder, and I'm interested in how you could use these tools when court records are not available online as they are in many states. Um, so, you know, could, could you use code to pull data from a Tyler bit database, even if it's not publicly available? Um, so yeah, how, how, do you, how do you approach a, a lack of availability of data? Or at least a lack of machine readable availability of data? I can answer for, for Burlington. Um, we, uh, I think I quickly showed the, um, you know, we have a place for adding counts when they haven't been online. So we, we, that, that is manually requesting the doctor from the court. Now they're more willing to email things with COVID. So that makes it a little easier. So they're just printing out a docket and, um, you know, so there's still efficiencies gained by entering it in and having it generate the, you know, generating these different documents all all with the same information. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, it's, it's, 
I mean, the data is obviously sitting somewhere um, and it's about making the right relationships to get it and, and showing that it's um, precedent in other states. Um, like I'd like to know, you know, like about like um, what David mentioned about using the Tyler API and I'd like to take that and show that to my state so I can get that more direct connection. But um, I, like I explained in another answer I um, wrote here uh, that, um, you know, they, they look to Maryland or the Vermont judiciary wanted to talk to Maryland before they entered the MOU with us um, to confirm that, you know, nothing um, blew up there from working with the brigade there, or that wasn't a brigade, that was another, um, you know, a similar, uh, um, you know, similar organization, but um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's my suggestion. If, uh, if I could jump on top of that, um, the ex expunge uh, VT project was kind of interesting from a data access standpoint, uh, because um, we didn't, didn't have access. What we ended up doing was using a Chrome extension in order to leverage the access that users already had uh, for users who are able to get into the system. Um, they can use our tool. And our tool itself doesn't gain any access. We don't have to make requests uh, for access. We don't have to you know, uh, scrape things the way uh, CourtBot is. Um, the flip side is that we are, of course, limited uh, by people who do have access. In, in our case, it works out because we were specifically targeting um, uh, volunteers at free expungement clinics, and we knew that categorically they had access. So um, it was a sidestep, but it worked very well for us. I can speak very briefly to the um, to the Boston approach. Um, it, if someone if someone whose name I don't recognize from the Boston team um, is on the call, please feel free to jump in. But um, I. I I was involved in the Boston project that at its beginning, I, I haven't been involved in that project in, um, in about a year. So my, my information may not be up, up to date, but um, in that instance, it, it was not just a lack of sort of electronic access to records, but a lack of access to a probation department that had any, any interest in working with us. And so it, it ended up being something uh, pretty similar that, that targeted um, being a tool for legal aid um, basically using DocAssemble to um, build, build forms more quickly and, and at least started out with, with the idea that, that we could build a um, eligibility checker that uh, just a person who was interested in finding out if they were eligible um, could go through and, and find out if it was worth their time. The, uh, the um, expungement, expungement laws in Massachusetts are um, on the convoluted side, um, at, at least for, for some of them. So. It, it takes quite a bit of, of uh, mental math to figure out if you're eligible. Um, let's see, so uh, Nick had a couple of questions um, in, in the chat here. I think one of them has been answered. Um, I, I see that Tim is typing an answer to that, but I'll, I'll, ask that, um, I'll ask that out loud so that maybe we can have a conversation about it. Um, so Nick says, Code for BTV has been working uh, working with Open Referral to address the data issue. Have you explored Open Referral? And uh, maybe Tim or Nick, you can give us a little bit of background on that question so that we can um, we can chat about it. Um, I have not explored Open Referral, but if that uh, is a possibility, that would be fantastic. Uh, Nicholas Flourish, I can't see you on my screen right now. Um, I'd love to connect. I'll, I'm going to drop my email actually. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk. Oh yeah. I, I realized that um, Nick can actually um, unmute himself. So Nick, if, if you want to ask the question um, in, in person, uh, go, go ahead and raise your hand and I can. Uh, oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, so when the National Data Civic Hacking happened, there was a whole uh, service gap question, right? Filling the service gaps, mapping the service gaps. And that brought us to explore um, community data, uh, community service data that was not necessarily from the state, but was just from the nonprofits and the various organizations that were helping. 
so we started exploring that. And actually, Yurit, who I think was here, is our project manager on this. She could talk more about it in detail later. Um, the point was just that, uh, first of all, getting the getting the list of initial services can be challenging, but maybe you've got it. And then the real the real challenge is keeping it up to date. So, open referral. Um, Greg Bloom, who's on the Code for America Slack, he can talk to you all about it. Uh, and he did a pre presentation of our Gay Congress. He has been working on this for years and trying to figure out ways um, more about building relationships to uh, and having a, a data standard, a data specification standard, a data API standard that uh, can be used by multiple organizations that are in this um, this area of uh, doing uh, information discovery, I guess, like two one one organizations, uh, helping them. Um, work with each other and having kind of a, a common uh, parlance to, to work with. So it may be the kind of thing where you want to explore what Greg has been working on. And, uh, you know, we've been trying to implement stuff uh, based on the open referral standards, but there are other existing examples out there as well. And it's, it's one of the biggest challenges, it seems, is keeping this data up to date and um, valid knowing that these things are accurate. So that's where the question came from. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you're right on about it being a very challenging aspect of a project like ours. Uh, you said the uh, project manager's name was Greg Bloom? Uh, yeah, the open referrals project is Greg Bloom. Uh, and Bloom. he's just at Bloom or, you know, okay. at symbol Bloom on CFA Slack. Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much. I, uh, I just posted a link to the YouTube video from Greg's, um, from Greg's talk at, at uh, Brigade Congress a few months ago, um, which is available if you want to check that out. Um, other, other folks uh, with questions, um, feel free to, to raise your hand if you'd like to ask them live or, or type them in, in the Q&A. Um, we, we have about 10 minutes left on the calendar, but um, we don't need to go all the way to the to the half hour if folks don't have other questions. Um, while while folks are thinking about about their questions, I'll put in a quick plug for next month. So, um, the next project standup is scheduled for April fourteenth, which is um, the, the second Wednesday. Um, I think it's actually the second Wednesday after the first Wednesday, if that's how. Anyway, it's it's April fourteenth. We are still working on confirming the exact details, but I think that we're gonna have a former CFA fellow from uh, way back in 2012, who's now at Mapbox um, do some guest hosting and we'll be um, highlighting some mapping projects. So that, that should be a lot of fun. Um, the details for that, uh, there's, a, um, there's a Brigade Project Stand Up schedule post on Discourse. And of course, uh, we'll be posting it on Slack as well. So I, I encourage anybody um, who is interested to check that out. I know uh, we all love making maps here at Code for America. Um, so that should be a fun one to work on and, and fun to uh, learn a bit about the, the map box um, in-kind resources that are available to brigades. Um, anybody else have questions or, or any of our panelists want to leave us with some, um, with any closing thoughts? Oh, I see a hand raised. Oh, go ahead, Michael. That's me. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a question maybe for Abby or Eli, um, sort of regarding um, narrowing your focus uh, with the court bot uh, implementation to um, evictions. Um, Code for BTV is uh, working on a court bot implementation right now and um, has not yet uh, selected a um, a partner currently working on the technical aspect. Um, I was curious, what, uh, uh, how did restricting that focus and having a particular, uh, I don't know if you mentioned a particular uh, uh, partner around uh, evictions, I think you did. Um, how did that either uh, help guide your work or uh, maybe expedite it? Um, or was that not an important part of uh, um, 
sort of the development phase of your project. Yeah, I'm happy to take a stab at answering that and then Eli or Eric, feel free to jump in. Um, Delaware is a really small state and so there are just two organizations, um, the place that I work and one other nonprofit that have lawyers that represent tenants in eviction cases. So the sort of pool of stakeholders is kind of small to begin with um, in terms of, you know, who is doing this work. It's us and one other office. Um, and I think part of what we decided felt like a good fit for evictions was some of the other sort of components of, of work being done in the community by other stakeholders that I mentioned. So there is this movement to push for a right to counsel for tenants and engage them through representation in the process, but that is sort of a long game and that doesn't happen quickly. Um, and so like Eli mentioned, there's also a group that's really doing a lot of grassroots organizing, canvassing in communities that are most impacted by eviction um, to try to engage them in understanding what their rights are and building trust um, you know, with the communities the community members. And so I think we felt like this um, sort of that bigger context within the community and the other things that are going on surrounding this issue, it, it felt like a good time to, um, you know, work on, on this in that space. Um, it certainly, I think, could be something that would benefit, you know, justice impacted individuals in the community as well, um, who are facing, you know, criminal charges. Um, I think one other sort of thing that I felt like was really important is that so so few people, you know, in eviction cases, so few tenants are represented. Um, whereas, you know, although public defenders are incredibly overburdened and have a lot of clients, um, you know, individuals who are facing, you know, a criminal case do have the right to representation. And so they have, in theory, you know, somebody who is is reminding them that they have court coming up and you know where they need to be and when. Um, although in practic in practice, that's easier said than done. But so I think we kind of felt like, um, you know, given everything else that was going on around this issue and sort of the landscape of, of what evictions look like right now for people in Delaware, that it just felt like um, a really great fit um, to, to try to introduce this tool in that context. So I don't know if that is helpful. I think the, we've also sort of gotten good reception from the courts because they similarly are interested in, in people participating in the process. That's just good for sort of, you know, their, um, you know, from their perspective as well. So I think we sort of, from, you know, most perspectives have a lot of buy-in from the different sort of stakeholders in the community. And so that sort of, I think, helped, you know, drive this project. I think that was well said. Great. Um, well, I'll feel free to, to jump in if you if you do still have questions. But I, I think we're we're about um, we're about coming to to a close here. Um, I do want to thank all of you for for attending um, and and especially thanking our our panelists from Vermont and Delaware and and the Santa Barbara Fellowship Team. Um, and, and thank you, David, for, for lending your expertise and, and guest hosting here. Um, it is, it's, it's cool to see um, the sort of breadth of work on, on criminal justice um, that's going on at CFA. Um, I will be posting the, the notes to this and then um, I, I, I won't have the, the YouTube video uploaded tonight, but I'll post it tomorrow, um, both on the discourse post as well as on Slack. Um, and I invite anybody who has further questions or wants um, to continue the conversation that they've been having to do so on that Slack thread. Um, my, my hope is that we can have a little bit of a, a discussion thread there. So, so please feel free to jump in there. Um, like I said, next month on the 14th, um, I hope to see folks there. Uh, and with that, I will um, I'll close this up. Thanks, thanks to everyone for attending and for participating. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.